If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. If you like this video, leave a like. Here is the organ that is seen in the laryngeal mirror. It is a framework of cartilages at the top of the trachea or windpipe. In it are structures which form a valve through which the breath passes. We should have a clear concept of these cartilages and muscles. This is a male larynx suspended from the hyoid bone and at the top of the section of the trachea. The most important cartilages are the thyroid, the cricoid, the two arytenoids, and the epiglottis. Let us build up a larynx part by part to study its structure and function. Here is a section of the trachea. It is composed of rings of cartilage which keep it open for the passage of air. However, it is flexible and distensible, and also the cartilaginous rings are incomplete at the back and are closed by muscular and membranous tissue. We shall place this section of the trachea on this spindle. This is the cricoid cartilage. It is the only cartilage in the larynx which is a complete ring closed at the back. It is shaped somewhat like a signet ring being smaller in front and having a large plate at the back. Its upper edge forms an oval. The cricoid is found at the top of the trachea. We have attached the cricoid cartilage to our spindle with two nails. Notice that there are four facets for the articulation of other cartilages. Two are concave. One. Two. These are for the thyroid cartilage. Two are convex with oval outlines. One, two. These are for the arytenoid cartilages. This is the left arytenoid cartilage. It is roughly pyramidal in shape, having three projections. The one at the top is called the apex. The large blunt one at the side is called the muscular process, and we shall find that several muscles attach to it. The smaller, flexible, pointed one extending to the front is called the vocal process, because the vocal ligament and vocalis muscle attach to it. On the underside of the muscular process is a concave, almost cylindrical facet for articulation with the cricoid. Notice that it is here 
under the muscular process. Let us put it in place. It has two possibilities of movement which we shall call rocking and gliding. It is held in place flexibly by a ligamentous capsule which is especially strong here. The ligament anchors the arytenoid to the cricoid plate here in the middle. Here is the rocking movement. There is also a gliding movement along the slope of the oval-shaped top of the cricoid. Of course, arytenoids come in pairs, so let us have the right one also in place. Now the two arytenoid cartilages are perched with the vocal processes pointing toward the front and their muscular processes fitting the convex facets on the curving upper edge of the cricoid plate. Ligaments hold them loosely and flexibly. Here are the muscles that move the arytenoids in various ways. The posterior cricoarytenoid muscles are these large ones which cover much of the cricoid plate. They are called posterior because they are at the back and they are called cricoarytenoid because they arise from the cricoid and are inserted in the arytenoids. With attached threads we can simulate the action of these muscles. We shall do the same with all the others as well. When the posterior cricoarytenoid muscles contract they separate the arytenoids with a complex movement, largely rocking. Joining the arytenoid cartilages at the back are three interarytenoid muscles. On the surface are two small, inconspicuous muscles crossing each other to make a letter X. They are called the oblique arytenoid muscles. Beneath them, running from side to side, is a larger, much more powerful muscle called the transverse arytenoid muscle. When these muscles contract, they draw the arytenoids together. The lateral cricoarytenoid muscles can now be seen. They are called lateral because they are at the sides and cricoarytenoid because they arise from the cricoid here and extend along the upper edge of this cartilage to be inserted in the arytenoids. Notice that these muscles attach to the muscular processes of the arytenoid cartilages. When the lateral cricoarytenoid muscles contract, the muscular processes are drawn forward. This results in an interesting adjustment of the vocal processes, which we shall see better in another position. We shall look down on these parts in much the same direction as they are seen in a laryngeal mirror. We observe the movements of the arytenoids as each pair of muscles contracts and exerts its pull. The posterior cricoarytenoid muscles separate the arytenoids with a rocking motion and the interarytenoids draw them together again with a rocking and upward gliding movement so that the apexes meet. The lateral cricoarytenoid muscles do this, rocking and gliding. The gliding movement may have a rotating component around the upper or lower corners of the cricoid facet. We notice that the muscular processes are drawn forward and the vocal processes contact each other. When both the laterals and the interarytenoids contract, there is firm contact between the arytenoid cartilages like this. These movements will become more meaningful when we see the vocal folds in place. For this we need a thyroid cartilage. Here is the thyroid cartilage. It has two wings fused at the front. 
The wings are fused only at the bottom, and there is a notch above. They are open at the back, and each wing has an upper horn and a lower horn. The lower horns articulate with facets on the cricoid cartilage. Now we have seen that the arytenoids are attached to the cricoid with a rocking and gliding articulation. This is also true of the cricothyroid articulation. The thyroid can articulation as its center thus. It can also glide a little. This is the cricothyroid ligament. It prevents the cartilages from moving too far apart at the front. Here are the cricothyroid muscles, so-called because they arise from the cricoid cartilage at the front and fan out toward the back to be inserted in the lower edge of the thyroid cartilage. When the cricothyroid muscles contract, there is a combination of both the rocking and the gliding of the thyroid cartilage. They pull partly downward and partly forward. These white bands are called the vocal ligaments. They extend from the angle of the thyroid cartilage to the arytenoid cartilages. One ligament is attached to each vocal process. When the cricothyroid muscles are relaxed, the vocal ligaments are slack. When the cricothyroid muscles contract, the ligaments are stiff. Under these conditions, at very high pitches, the vocal ligaments function almost independently of the vocal muscles, rather like strings. We notice that the action of the cricothyroid muscles tenses the ligaments, but does not bring them together. These are the thyroarytenoid muscles. They arise from the thyroid cartilage and are inserted in the arytenoid cartilages. They are complex and are composed of several bundles of muscle fiber. The bundles which lie beside the vocal ligaments and which are loosely connected to them, are the internal thyroarytenoid muscles. They attach in part to the vocal processes and extend toward the muscular processes and form the body of the vocal folds. The internal thyroarytenoid muscles are also called the vocalis muscles. More colloquially, these structures, consisting of the vocalis muscles, the vocal processes, and the vocal ligaments are called the true vocal cords. Lying beside the internal thyroarytenoids are the external thyroarytenoid muscles, part of which has been removed and does not show in our picture at this moment. They attach to the muscular processes and all along the outside edges of the arytenoid cartilages up toward the apex. Let us observe the functions of the adjusting muscles with reference to the vocal folds. Moving the vocal folds away from the center is called abduction. Moving the vocal folds toward the midline is called adduction. When the posterior cricoarytenoids contract, the arytenoid cartilages are separated and the space between the vocal folds is large. This space is called the glottis. In breathing, the glottis is open. The posterior cricoarytenoids are the chief abductory muscles. The interarytenoid muscles, on the other hand, are adductory. When they contract, the apexes of the arytenoids are drawn together. Posterior cricoarytenoid interarytenoid. The lateral cricoarytenoid muscles bring the vocal processes toward midline. Here is what happens when they work alone. We see that the lateral cricoarytenoid muscles exert a leverage so that the vocal processes are pressed together. We shall call this medial compression.
But to close the glottis completely, we must contract both the lateral cricoarytenoid muscles and the interarytenoid muscles. Posterior, laterals, interarytenoids. Posterior, laterals, interarytenoids. Posterior, laterals, interarytenoids. Posterior. When the thyroarytenoid muscles contract, they reduce the distance between the angle of the thyroid and the arytenoid cartilages, and the vocal ligaments are slackened. On the other hand, when the thyroid moves forward, away from the arytenoids, the vocal folds are stretched. It is the cricothyroid muscles that do this. This action stretches the vocal folds. We shall call it longitudinal tension. We might expect longitudinal tension to close the glottis, but instead there appears a narrow opening, even though the interarytenoid muscles are contracting. Adequate medial compression will close this chink. Here is an interior view of the larynx. The thyroid cartilage has been cut through here, here is the front of the cricoid, also cut through, and here is the plate. It has been necessary to drive two nails through the cricoid. This is the arytenoid cartilage. Here is what happens when the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle contracts. Now the lateral cricoarytenoid. Posterior, lateral. Posterior, lateral. This is the vocal ligament. It is the thickened upper edge of a membrane which strengthens the underside of the thyroarytenoid muscles. This membrane is called the conus elasticus. Its lower edge attaches to the upper edge of the cricoid cartilage, and it includes the cricothyroid ligament. As we see the specimen now, there is no longitudinal tension, and so the vocal fold is loose and thick. The cross-section of the vocal fold is determined by the thickness of the vocalis muscle when the longitudinal tension is very small. We shall call the tone produced by such an adjustment chest voice. Now, as longitudinal tension is applied, see how the vocal fold thins out. This thin edge is really the vocal ligament. When longitudinal tension is great, the shape of the vocal fold is largely determined by the vocal ligament. We shall call this the falsetto adjustment. As a matter of convenience, the action of the cricothyroid muscle is usually conceived as causing the thyroid cartilage to rock on the cricoid cartilage. It is shown thus in our film. However, if the thyroid is held motionless, the cricoid must rock. Thus, This is more nearly what happens in life. However, for the highest tones of the voice, when the muscles of the throat lift the larynx, the larynx as a whole is tilted. The vocal folds are stretched in any case, but the picture in the laryngeal mirror is different. For the lowest pitches, when the cricothyroids are not contracting, the arytenoids obscure the view of the back part of the folds. This position gives the best view. We are now going to apply air to our specimen and observe the vibration of the vocal folds. It will be necessary to remove the horns of the thyroid to avoid interference with our thread. 